Little things about the phone have come up in the last few weeks that I've been using it. For example, it turns on the speaker when you pick up the call from the cover screen. You flip open the phone, the voice call shifts to the earpiece, and shutting it close disconnects the call. And obviously, all of this is customizable too. The unique form factor has its own advantages. Undoubtedly, it makes it very compact in folded state, very easy to store anywhere, be it bags, or car compartments, or glass holders, or... And sure, it does get a bit thicker when you fold it, but it still doesn't occupy as much space in your pocket. I tried to tie my shoelaces, I even tried to take like a high jump, and it was all very comfortable, you know, unlike big phones that hit your thigh or your waist depending on how you bend, this is really comfortable that way. Also, because the material is soft and has this ultra smooth texture, it slides right into the pocket very effortlessly. Also, this folding design really lets you have very relaxed video calls. Just place the phone in the front, get the right angle, and you talk hands-free. And this is what Samsung calls flex mode. And if you plan to vlog or take online classes, it makes it easy to shoot even if you don't have a tripod around. The phone supports wireless charging and reverse wireless charging as well. And unlike the Flip 3, it now supports 25 watt fast charging. That was much needed. Now there are certain design issues though, and I'll briefly touch upon them towards the end of the video, so stay hooked. But right now let's focus on what it can do. Now, despite having a folding display, the screen is still one of the best out there and it stacks right up with the flagships. It's super sharp and color rich, punchy and super bright. The brightness, even outdoors, is very impressive and you do have the option for extra brightness even if there's a rare scenario you don't find it bright enough. Now, what's really interesting is that it's a tall, slim and a narrow phone, almost like a skinny brother of the Galaxy S22 Plus. But it's nothing that bothers me. Sure, it felt a little different at first, but I grew really fond of it very quickly, especially in landscape mode. So whether you're watching movies or TV shows or just streaming on YouTube, it all feels super wide in a good way. Okay, now let's talk about the elephant in the room, that crease. Look, it's there, and it's not like it's significantly reduced over the Flip 3, but you grow used to it so quickly that it stops bothering you. Unless you're someone who likes to watch a lot of videos outdoors. Because outdoors, occasionally, if the sun hits your phone's display at a certain angle, it does reflect some light while watching that video. But other than that, it's been quite a bit of a non-issue for me personally, so yeah. But you know what's the biggest upgrade on this phone? Performance. Because now with the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chip, not only do you get more performance, but you also get improved photography, improved videography, and better battery life. Let me explain. First, the SoC brings plenty raw power with it. High clock speed, high performance scores that delivers super performance. I mean, I could max out Call of Duty settings and play without any hiccup, even in multiplayer mode, no lag at all. Super smooth gaming, the refresh rate was a consistent 60 FPS, and the temperatures did not go above 40, which is acceptable. I mean, so the phone was not super hot or anything. In fact, if you want more gaming performance, you could go into Game Launcher, then into Settings here, and then into Labs and you could enable this setting here that allows it to perform better but at some possible heating. But gaming aside, even everyday regular use is super snappy on this. I mean using the phone is really fun, even more so because it doesn't feel slow at all, it's just so responsive and it's so smooth. I loved using the phone. Second, the other area that benefits from improved processor is photos and videos and while the Flip 4 also uses a bigger camera sensor than the Flip 3, the processor also enables technologies that we saw in the Galaxy S22. Things like improved portrait photography wherein using AI stereo depth mapping, the phone is able to take accurate portrait photos. I'll leave a link below to download these photos that you see here and that way you can evaluate the quality for yourself. The other thing it enables is improved low light photos or nightography as Samsung likes to call it. It's definitely better than the last gen, you know, good amount of detail, noise is filtered well using AI and overall a very crisp low light photo in my opinion. But again, why just depend on me? Download these pictures from the link in the description below and just check it out yourself. And even videos in low light benefit from VDIS that again depends on real-time computations powered by the CPU to reduce shake and increase image sharpness. Now of course, having optical image stabilization helps VDIS do its job even better. 
Now, one of the best things about this phone when it comes to photos and videos is the fact that you can use this preview window to see what it is that you're taking a photo of or shooting a video of. And the best thing is that you get these really high quality selfie photos as well as super sharp 4K quality selfie videos. And that actually no flagship can compete with right now. For example, look at these selfie photos that I took using the front camera and then the rear camera. And you can clearly see that the rear camera selfies are slightly brighter, they're slightly bit punchy and it's sharper for sure. I almost look like washed out in the front facing camera. Now, let's talk about uh, battery. And I know that's the most sensitive and the most critical thing about folding thin phones. But before I share my usage stats with you, do keep in mind that they've increased the battery capacity by 10%. They've improved the wired and wireless charging speeds and they use a more battery efficient Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 SoC. So theoretically, it should give you better battery life. But you know what? Let's get real. So here are my usage stats from the first few days and you can see that I barely got more than three hours of screen on time and that's really low to begin with. So I was a bit disappointed uh, in the beginning. But okay, all of this were the first few days, my battery was still learning and adapting to my usage patterns. So after three days, I looked at the stats again. Did things change? Well, absolutely. I started crossing three and almost touched four hours after a gap of these three days. So it was definitely better. But take a closer look. I was barely using my phone to be honest, which is why my standby time is very high and screen on time is low. You can see that I was charging after 20 hours or sometimes even after one full day. That's because I just wasn't using my phone enough to have a significant screen on time. And so most of the time my phone was just sitting idle and draining battery. And so I decided to forcefully drain the battery like intentionally and see how long it lasts. I charged it to 100%, started watching Netflix and YouTube, and I got a screen on time of more than 8 hours if I was purely just watching content. And then I decided to use it like an average user. Not like me, because you know, my SOT is too small because my standby is too high, and not like draining it completely intentionally, but more like an average person. And I was getting consistently between 4 to 5 hours of SOT screen on time, and that's what you should expect too when you're using this phone. Sure, you could turn off always on display, you could turn off Bluetooth, you could turn off GPS and extend it by another 15, 20 minutes, five and a half hours at most, but that's about it. But you know, the battery charges really quickly. I mean, it goes from zero to 50% in like 30 minutes if you use the 25 watt charger. So if you have like easy access to chargers around you all the time, this is a non-issue. I mean, just plug it in and you'll be like ready to go. Now, if you're someone who travels a lot, you're always out on the road the whole day, maybe carry a portable charger with you and you'll be fine. But yeah, uh, that's the truth of it. And lastly, I'll just touch upon the cover screen. Now, they've introduced a few new widgets and I do talk about them in my first impressions video. You can check it out here in the top right corner. But one of the main things they've introduced is the ability to quickly and instantly call any of your top three contacts through a widget. But other than that, it's pretty much the same thing. You would pretty much be using it only for reading notifications, changing music tracks, and using it as a preview window for taking selfie photos or videos. Pretty much it. Now, there are a few small things in addition to all of the stuff that I've talked about, which I think I really should highlight. And the first thing is that the vibration intensity of this thing is amazing. It's one of the best that I've ever used. Listen to this. And the other thing that I've noticed, and it's really surprising because I've used the S22, the S22 Ultra, the Wi-Fi reach of this phone, like it catches signal in the remotest corners of my house that the other phones didn't. So there's definitely something better going on here. Now, there are also a few things that I should talk about. It may be an issue for some of you. None of these are deal breakers in my opinion, but nevertheless, I should highlight. First, there's no dex mode. Second, there's no telephoto lens. Third, Constantly closing and opening the phone multiple times a day could become annoying for some of you. Fourth, the phone is not dust resistant. It's only water resistant. So that risk is always there. The fastest charging you get is at 25 watt and it doesn't support anything higher than that. I mean, it still charges really quickly, but you won't get 45 watt or 65 watt of fast charging on this. 
And lastly, and this is me just nitpicking by the way, uh, it does have fair amount of bezels on the sides of the screen. But that's because it's a folding phone, it does need a bit of border to protect its screens from hitting each other. But I think they're going to finesse this over time and if there's anyone who's going to do it, it's hopefully going to be Samsung first because we know that they know how to make bezel-less displays. Look guys, a few years ago, folding displays was just a concept and this phone is proof of how well it can be done without being atrociously expensive. Do note, it is still cheaper than many phones that still don't fold. It's a pure standout and every party that I've been to, I've had someone or the other walk up to me and ask me about the phone. I love getting their reactions on the phone and it does help me build my own insights about how people think about uh, foldable phones. Now, I've tried to articulate my entire experience with the phone over the last few weeks, but if you guys still have any questions, feel free to ask me in the comments section and of course, I'll help you out. Now, I really hope this video was helpful and if it was, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the channel guys, and hit that bell notification icon and mark all. Really helps the channel grow. I'll see you in the next one.